Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society's webinar uh, today, previewing the 2021 through 2022 term of the United States Supreme Court. My name is Pat Kilbane, and uh, I'm honored to serve as the president of our local Federalist Society chapter. Um, this webinar um, is backed by popular demand. We had uh, such high praise for the preview session that we had last year that we've invited uh, two of our panelists back, and we have a new one. And uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, chapter member, Brian Gowdy, who will then introduce our panelists. Most of you um, on today's webinar know Brian. Before Brian went to law school, he was an active duty surface warfare officer in the United States Navy. Brian's a board certified appellate attorney and he's approaching 100 oral arguments before the US Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, the Supreme Court of Florida, along with five, uh, Florida's five state district court uh, of appeals. He's also orally argued before the US Supreme Court and the US Court of Appeals for the fourth and fifth circuits. He was, an, he was a law clerk to the Honorable uh, Susan Black on the 11th Circuit and also the Honorable Maurice Paul on the Northern District of Florida. Brian, thanks again for putting such uh, a stellar panel together and, um, and, and for this presentation again. Uh, th thank you, thank you so much, Pat. Appreciate uh, you uh, letting us do this. Um, and uh, Pat mentioned last year, we, we had uh, three panelists um, and uh, I'm gonna introduce the two that are back and the, and the new uh, panelists. I did wanna mention the one panelist we had last year who's not back is uh, Brian Fletcher. Uh, and the reason for that in part is he's pretty busy these days. He's actually the uh, acting Solicitor General of the United States right now. Uh, you're filling that void until um, President Biden's uh, nomination is confirmed. So I thought you all that attended last year might, might find that interesting. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, but we're very happy with uh, and very uh, thankful and grateful for uh, the three panelists who agreed to, to come back this year. And I'll introduce each of them. The first uh, who's uh, new uh, is Henry Whittaker. Uh, he uh, just became our Solicitor General here in Florida in July. Uh, before that, uh, he was serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General. And before that, he was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Office of Legal Counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice. Prior to that, Henry worked on the appellate staff of the Civil Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. He was a clerk to Justice Thomas at the Supreme Court and Judge Sentel of the uh, Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit after graduating from Harvard Law School and Yale College. Uh, our other panelist who's back is uh, Sarah H Harris. Sarah is a partner with Williams and Connolly Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group. Last term, she argued two cases before the Supreme Court and won both which is quite a feat. She uh, currently represents parties in two pending merits cases in the upcoming term. Widely recognized for advocacy, uh, Law 360 named her recently an appellate MVP. Bloomberg Law has named her to their list of top 40 advocates under 40. And before joining Williams and Connolly, Sarah was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel. And she also clerked for Justice Thomas at the Supreme Court. And, and last but not least is Joe Palmore, who co-chairs the uh, Morrison Enforcers Appellate and Supreme Court Practice Group. He's the managing partner of the DC office. Uh, he's argued 12 times before the US Supreme Court and more than 44, I'm sorry, 45 times in other appellate courts nationwide. Uh, before joining Morrison Enforcer, Joe was an assistant to the Solicitor General at the Department of Justice, and he clerked for Justice Ginsburg. So um, thank you each uh, for participating today. Um, we're gonna basically, for the audience, so you understand where we're headed in the next hour, and we are gonna try to end promptly at one, uh, so you can get on with your day. We're gonna spend uh, about 20 minutes on some general topics, uh, basically the oral argument, shadow docket, and Justice Barrett and her impact. 
And then we're going to turn for about another 20, 25 minutes on uh, three high interest cases that I think will will interest, I hope will interest all of you. And then we're going to just conclude and let each panelist talk about any other expected cases of interest. Uh, and we are, we are trying to leave eight to 10 minutes at the end for question and answers. Uh, I believe you should be able to post those, um, not in the chat, but in the question and answer, and I'll do my best to try to feel those. Um, so please be thinking of those as we're going along. So I'm going to start uh, with the first general topic we have, and I'm going to let Sarah talk about it. And it's about oral argument. And I think most people know the court uh, for the last, you know, since the pandemic started, as we all say, in March of 2000, when was it, 20, uh, they've been doing oral argument by phone, but now uh, there's going to be a return to the courtroom. And so, uh, Sarah, I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so the Supreme Court is keeping it interesting uh, at all stages of the pandemic. I think it's trying to deal with the various challenges that doing much in person all the time poses. And so I think one of the hot topics in the Supreme Court bar these days is really just sort of the question of which argument format is best. Uh, and each has its defenders. Um, as Brian noted, starting in May 2020, the Supreme Court held remote telephonic arguments. And um, I think it's safe to say they exceeded expectations, notwithstanding some early issues with like toilet flushing in the background. Um, <laughs> you know, the court, I think like everyone, I, I think there's a general consensus. They really did a good job at least making sure that arguments proceeded. And the format was seriatim questioning. So people get two minutes to start off with their sort of summation, which is now a regular feature of arguments. And then the justices go down the line, starting with the chief. And then uh, in order of seniority, so Justice Thomas is next. And all nine of them get their say. So you are doing a sort of one-on-one -on -one question and answer session with nine justices. Each one gets about two and a half minutes. Uh, how did that work? So uh, I had, as Brian noted, two arguments this past term. I would say the pros are that you get more un uninterrupted time one-on-one -on -one with questions, which can be really helpful if you have as I did, <laughs> some really arcane administrative law cases uh, to sort of walk through some of the, you know, trickier aspects of your case. It is nice to have that, that time with just one justice and not everyone kind of in a scrum jumping on you. Uh, the other potential plus, although I did not seize upon it, is that you could wear anything you want because no one can see you. I did note that some advocates appear to have worn hoodies and sweatpants. Maybe I'm just a little more traditional, I wore a suit. Um, and the downside, of course, is that you, also the upside, you're at, the, you're at a justice's mercy for two and a half minutes. So I suspect there were a lot of people who were representing criminal defendants, for instance, who wished that Justice Alito did not have quite so much time with them. Um, the other downside is you can't see the justice's facial reactions, which often is really helpful to know if you're making headway uh, or not making headway. So you don't see nods, you don't see shaking of head, you just have to read them based on their voice and the tenor of their questioning. So I liked it. I, I happened to like the format. I thought it was, I mean, it was what it was. I thought the court did well with it. Um, but I think it was a little divisive in the bar. And now there's a new format starting in a couple of days, which is going to be pretty exciting, which is something of a return to the old scrum. So arguing counsel still get two minutes to start off and then a free for all in person, just uh, the advocate and a plus one and I guess a couple of members of the press and the justices. So very kind of intimate argument format. And then after the seriatim question, or after the scrum, there's another bonus round of seriatim questions so that no one knows how long argument's gonna last now. And I think the other two interesting questions of this new format are, first of all, does it mean Justice Thomas will still ask questions? A lot of people, including myself, are big fans of hearing Justice Thomas' questions. Um, he has said on the record he doesn't particularly like the sort of justices asking questions on top of each other format. And it seems like well, he certainly was very active in the seriatim format. So I think people are hoping he'll continue. And then second of all, how are the justices who approach argument very strategically going to sort of use this format strategically? Are they going to just sort of go in in the free-for-all stage, or are they gonna wait to really sort of pick up on particularly pressing questions in the seriatim stage to try to extract concessions? I don't know, it'll be interesting to see, and I'm not sure they know either. 
Okay, great. Uh, uh, Henry or Joe, either one of you want to jump in? Uh, I, I really want to hear what Henry has to think about this format. So. <laughs> Oh, well, sure. Well, I think this is a, a welcome development. I, I guess I'm from the school where I, I kind of think in general that we don't spend, we don't allocate enough time to oral argument in the appellate courts in general, and including in the Supreme Court. So I think that to the extent, you know, there's more time to sort of uh, work issues out and the like, I think that's, that's a welcome development. One interesting apparent change as well, that is probably somewhat slipped under the radar is apparently that they are also um, contrary to longstanding practice, they are in, in instances where the solicitor general's office is participating as an amicus and is getting divided argument time. Traditionally, at, in a 30 minute argument, you, usually the side the solicitor general's office is supporting would get 10 minutes of the uh, party of the, of the 30 minutes that ordinarily would be allocated to a party. It looks like the court has started to move to, uh, at least in, in, in some recent orders, is giving the SG's office actually 15 minutes. The, uh, the side the SG's office is supporting 20 minutes and the other side 30 minutes, which is interesting. So they want they want to hear more, I guess, from the Solicitor General's office, uh, even in the free for all, uh, which is an interesting new development, I think. Thank you. And I, and I also want to hear with Joe. I didn't mean to. Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, I, now, I'll just briefly point out, uh, I mean, underline something Sarah said. What, it, what's interesting about this new format is it really is a it, it's a hybrid, right? I mean, the 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 um, Telephone arguments had supporters and detractors, and Sarah and I, I'm kind of with Sarah, I kind of liked it, uh, but there are a lot of people in the bar who, who didn't, who missed the old free-for-all and the ability of justices to kind of feed off each other. And so what's interesting about this is that the court is basically doing doing both. They're going to have the free-for-all and then the seriatim questioning. So they're kind of appealing to both sides of that debate. Okay, great. Um... So we're going to move next to a, a term that maybe many of you are familiar with if you read the news, which is the shadow docket. And I'll let Joe explain what that is and uh, other uh, points he's thought about this development at the court. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so the shadow docket, this is a term that was coined by Professor Will Bode at Chicago. I think the term is becoming a little bit controversial and some people prefer to call this the emergency docket, um, but I'll just use shadow docket because it sounds cooler. Um, what, so what is the shadow docket? It's really defined by what it isn't. It's basically any decision that the court issues outside of its normal merits docket, the merits document being what we think of as you know full briefing, amicus briefs are filed, there's oral argument, and then the opinion comes out. The court makes a whole bunch of decisions that don't fall into that core category. Some of them are just kind of uncontroversial, like denials of cert technically are on the shadow docket, granting extensions of time, things like that. Uh, but, but the court can and does make really significant consequential decisions uh, on the shadow docket. The kind of, what I was clerking, the kind of core use of, of these emergency orders were stays of execution, right? Those were, those were something that the court got all the time and they, you know, they make sense. Like you should hear my appeal uh, because I, it will be moot um, if I'm executed and the court would, would either grant or deny a stay at the, at the last moment. Uh, election cases have historically also lent themselves to, to emergency action by the court. Uh, most famously, perhaps in 1973, and this is an interesting fact, Justice Douglas actually enjoined the bombing of Cambodia uh, in a single justice order. Uh, and that was then reversed by, unanimously reversed by the other eight justices about six hours later. So that was probably the most famous uh, controversial use of, of, of the shadow docket. Uh, that notwithstanding, there weren't that many orders like that over the years. Um, and so there's some data that was put together recently that during the two terms of President Bush and the two terms of President Obama, so it's, you know, uh, 16 years, two very different presidents, uh, the Solicitor General went to the Supreme Court to get some kind of emergency relief only eight times in those 16 years. Four were granted and four were denied. Uh, but then um, when President Trump took office, there was a big change and there's a debate about why that change took place. Uh, but there was, but no one disagrees that a big change happened. Uh, the Solicitor General filed 41 applications for relief in just four years. So that's 20 times more often than under Bush. Or, uh, or Obama, and these were largely successful. The SG was quite successful in getting the injunctions from the court, getting stays of lower court orders. Um, 
And so why was this happening under under President Trump? Again, there's a kind of a de- debate about this, but it, I think every, most people do agree that there was an uptick in lower court injunctions against uh, executive branch activity. Um, and then there was an increased appetite on the part of the Department of Justice to go to the Supreme Court and get those injunctions stayed or set aside. Um, and, and, it, and it worked in many cases. Um, you saw the Supreme Court uh, vacating stays of that lower courts had issued in federal death penalty cases. Um, you saw um, a lot of cases about uh, immigration. Um, and then private parties also got into the act uh, and started filing more emergency applications than perhaps they had before because, again, th- certain claims were, were, were uh, being uh, greeted favorably by the, by the court particularly in the area of COVID restrictions. Uh, there were a number of religious entities, churches, synagogues that went to the court to get uh, uh, COVID gathering orders, uh, capacity orders set aside for as applied to religious entities. Um, and those applications were generally denied while Justice Ginsburg was on the court because the Chief Justice was joining with the, the court's liberals to, uh, to deny them. But then when Justice Barrett replaced Justice Ginsburg, those started being granted. Um, we've seen now a, a, a continuation of the activity of the court uh, on, the, uh, on these emergency uh, basis, uh, even under President Biden. Um, the court set aside the CDC eviction moratorium. It set aside a separate a New York eviction moratorium. Um, it declined the request by the Solicitor General to stay a lower court order directing President Biden to continue President Trump's remain in Mexico policy. And then famously, just a few weeks ago, the court uh, declined to enjoin uh, the Texas abortion law, SB 8. So what are the criticisms of the, of the, the, the so-called shadow docket? Well, Justice Kagan articulated a couple of them in, in her dissent in the SB 8 case. She said the majority's decision is emblematic of too much of this court's shadow docket decision making, she's the first justice to use the term, which every day becomes more unreasoned, inconsistent, and impossible to defend, she said. Um, The criticisms are that there's often a lack of reasoning, opinions aren't issued, sometimes the justices' votes aren't even recorded, unpredictable timing, there's rarely an opportunity for a lot of amicus participation in these orders, despite the fact that they can make pretty pretty consequential decisions. Um, and, uh, And sometimes the court Critics say the court is inconsistent with respect to how it treats you know, procedural obstacles. When it really wants to reach a certain uh, substantive result, it seems to, uh, the, the critics say, kind of plow through procedural obstacles to review, for instance, a couple of the COVID restrictions that the court enjoined had actually already expired. But in other cases, SB8, uh, where, for instance, uh, where there are procedural questions, the court uses that as a basis for denial. So anyway, what it, it seems that this is an area where the 6-3 conservative court will probably continue to be uh, to be receptive to certain kinds of claims. And I think we'll, we're likely to see a lot more uh, activity on the on the shadow or emergency docket going forward. OK, thank you. That was really informative. Um, uh, Sarah, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I guess two thoughts. One is I, I agree with Joe's sort of explanation for why this is happening. I think the phenomenon that is really the huge driver of the emergency application docket is nationwide injunctions. So I think Joe mentioned about 41 applications in four years for the Trump administration. And if you look at the numbers, a lot of them are like literally the same policies because like six district courts would enjoy enjoy like the travel ban um, or other immigration policies. And the Solicitor General's office would obviously go to the court on all of them. And there was sort of a back and forth on multiple iterations of these policies because it was sort of a, the minute, you know, the administration does X, district courts do not X. And it, it just is sort of a vicious cycle of constant request for relief because I think it is very unusual for a nationwide policy to be halted in its tracks very quickly by a district court. And then no one except for the Supreme Court can really do anything about it. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't know, I, you hear a lot of criticism of the shadow docket, and I feel like one way or another, the, the only thing for the court to do is decide whether they think nationwide injunctions are appropriate. That's been bubbling up for a long time. I have no doubt that the Biden administration will also probably be in this game of having to go to the court a lot, at least once its rulemaking gets underway more. Um, and I guess the other comment is, 
I'm not sure it's a bad thing that the justices don't have to record their votes or are sort of doing tentative opinions because I think it does actually leave them leeway. There are cases in which the court, for instance, now less sexy cases that you may not be following, like the arbitration docket. But I think it's a good example. Last term, for instance, the court granted a stay um, that benefited the petitioning party that said their case was going to be moot if the if the Supreme Court did not order a stay of a trial that the party said should be arbitrated. And so they got a stay, they essentially got a, a grant of cert later on, and then the court ended up saying the case should never have been granted and dismissed it. So I think in that situation, it illustrates that sometimes the court wants to leave itself flexibility because you are getting only a limited window into the case. And if you have to dig too much into the, the first stage, you, it's just too short of a time and you do wanna leave flexibility to change your mind later. Yeah, I, th I think all, all that's all that is is very interesting. I mean, one one, uh, one in, uh, I actually think that that uh, I mean, the court has these emergency applications before them. They've got to decide them as best they can. I mean, it, it's been true for a long time that the court has actually said that when when a government seeks emergency relief, particularly when one of its policies is being uh, enjoined as unconstitutional, then that's kind of a a special circumstance that that can warrant, uh, uh, you know, a stay, a, a, a stay of of, uh, of a lower court ruling in many instances. And, and when I was in the civil division of the Department of Justice, I was making these kinds of arguments in defending the government's "don't ask, don't tell" policy long before the shadow docket term had even been been coined. So this is something that that to, to some degree has been inherent in the doctrine for some time. I do think it's interesting that 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 some uh, of the you know how the sort of procedural objections to the shadow docket decision making kind of kind of shift sometimes because in the in the SB8 case Justice Hagan was sort of you know critical of the of of procedurally critical of what the court was doing in that case of course she voted to grant the emergency relief in that case which which is interesting you might one might have thought that if she had had a procedural objection to sort of proceeding quickly and not receiving full briefing maybe the the default would be the status quo on the flip side, um, I actually, this wasn't technically a shadow docket case, but another re, uh, interesting recent case from the last term was the Lombardo, uh, G, which was actually technically, I don't know if you call it a summary reversal or a GVR, but was it a case where um, it had been pending? It was a cert petition from an Eighth Circuit uh, decision that involved an excessive force claim, which sort of uh, had shades of, of the George Floyd incident in that you know, it involved police officers who'd kind of been holding down a suspect and so forth and an excessive force claim. And the court held on to that petition for a long time. In the end, the court by a six to three vote with Justices uh, Barrett, Kavanaugh, and the chief joining uh, Kagan, uh, Sotomayor, and Breyer basically GVR'd and said, well, we're sort of not certain about what the Eighth Circuit did. So we'll, we think maybe it got it wrong in certain respects. And so we'll just sort of send it back. And then you had Justice Alito in his dissent making sort of this some similar kind of procedural objection, shadow docket-like procedural objection saying, well, I'm not sure whether the court is right or wrong, but at a minimum, if we don't like what the Eighth Circuit did, we should set the case for plenary argument. He didn't even say he thought the decision was correct. It was. It seemed to be a purely procedural objection. So I think that contrast is interesting, how sometimes maybe the, you know, the different sides are making different kinds of procedural objections. Brian, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Sarah. I just was talking to myself in my office here for five minutes. Uh, um, I, uh, sorry, I wanted to remind everybody out there that we have um, uh, questions and answers at the end. And um, if you do have any questions, please post them. I'm looking right now in the box. I don't, I don't see any yet. So even if you just said hello to me like Sarah did, that would make me feel better. Um, anyhow, let's move to our next uh, topic. Um, and uh, that is uh, uh, how has Justice Barrett impacted the court and what will be her impact on the, this upcoming term? Um, we're going to have uh, Henry take the lead on this topic. 
Sure. Well, I mean, I think uh, part of her impact uh, has already been previewed by by Joe's comments, as as Joe mentioned. Uh, one of the one of the most tangible ways you can so, sort of uh, see a Supreme Court justice's impact is compare, uh, you know, what would happen if if the the justice he or she replaced were on the court compared to what happened uh, with uh, the justice on the court, the new justice on the court, and we saw that impact I think quite directly in the on the shadow docket in the in the COVID religious liberty cases where you had a number of cases last term where the court by a a five to four vote with uh, Chief Justice Roberts providing the decisive vote to deny emergency relief in those cases, uh, and then and then when with the flip to Justice Barrett, you saw this term the court has started to uh, be more receptive to those those uh, those claims and a number of different decisions, and actually has has uh, on the shadow docket uh, issued a number of uh, pretty significant uh, free exercise clause opinions uh, interpreting the, the Smith case. In, in ways that that uh, yeah the courts never 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 directly said before, um, and, and, which is interesting. Uh, over the chief justice dissent, sometimes although not always, um, uh, the chief has gone along with some and and has uh, dissented in others. Uh, interestingly, uh, not not clear that the chief is really has a objection to the merits analysis in those cases. It seems to be more at times a, a prudential. Type of objection to, to, to in entering injunctions on the shadow docket, which is also interesting. Um, apart from that, I mean, I think there are relatively few cases you can sort of point to where oh five where, where sort of Justice Barrett's vote seems to have make made a decisive difference compared to having Justice Ginsburg on the court. I think two notable ones uh, were the Arthrex case, uh, which was a separation of powers case involving a constitutional challenge to these uh, patent judges who the claim was that because of the that, that these judges make uh, exercise final decision making power within an administrative agency that they need to be that they are principal officers and they're to be therefore under the appointments clause need to be uh, appointed by the president by and with the advice and consent of the Senate when in fact they were not so appointed. And interestingly, uh, Justice Barrett jo joined a five justice majority to, to uh, uphold that claim um, over the dissent of uh, Justices Thomas, interestingly enough, and uh, Justices Kagan, Breyer, and, and Sotomayor. Um, the other case uh, with actually the same uh, lineup uh, was the TransUnion case, which involved a uh, a case about Article Three standing uh, requirements, and uh, there are several issues in the case. Uh, maybe the most meaty was sort of the question of whether Congress has the constitutional authority in some instances to, or uh, whether whether Article Three standing requirements restrict the constitutional authority of Congress to enact statutes. The majority said it did. Uh, you know, Justice Thomas in dissent uh, said it didn't, and, and that was interesting. And, and uh, you know, always hard to predict these votes, but but it seems likely that those court, those cases could have come out a different way with uh, Justice Ginsburg on the court. Apart from that, another interesting thing I thought about Justice Barrett's, uh, and obviously we don't have very many uh, many data points, but um, I think that there is some evidence based on uh, some of her writings and votes so far that um, she has somewhat of a reluctance to overrule precedent, and we saw this perhaps most directly in the Fulton case where which uh, involved a free exercise challenge to the city of Philadelphia's uh, uh, refusal to uh, uh, deal with a, a, foster, a foster care agency on the basis of the fact that the agency would not uh, provide foster care services to same-sex couples and to which it had a religious objection. And the court, uh, the court said that, that that did indeed violate the free exercise clause, but did so on sort of uh, more narrow grounds than uh, perhaps some had expected. Uh, the, that, that case implicated a, a, a precedent called uh, Smith, which says in general, a laws of, of neutral and general applicability uh, uh, do not raise uh, free exercise concerns. Uh, there's a great controversy over whether the Smith case should be overruled, whether it correctly interpreted the free exercise clause. The majority decided the case and said, well, we don't need to revisit Smith. Um, we can decide it on more narrow grounds. Uh, there was a, a strong dissent by, by uh, or I guess a concurrence by Justice Alito saying, taking the majority to task uh, quite uh, severely for, for not reaching this question. And Justice Barrett and concurrence actually expressed agreement uh, 
on the merits with Justice Alito's opinion, but but raised some prudential concerns uh, with with uh, that that overruling Smith might might call it, might create, and I thought that was interesting, which were even joined by Justice Breyer uh, and, and also Justice Kavanaugh joined the entire opinion. So I thought that was interesting, and there are some other other decisions that are sort of of a piece that she uh, participated in. One, one interesting one I thought, uh, which is maybe a little bit under the radar, was Justice Barrett wrote the majority opinion in this securities fraud case involving Goldman Sachs, where it involved the interpretation of this case called Basic Inc. versus Levinson, which involves, sets forth standards for when a, uh, a securities fraud plaintiff can prove reliance on misrepresentations, uh, on a company's misrepresentations. And Justice Barrett's opinion was very much uh, there was an issue about whether the defendant had the burden of proof to rebut the presumption of reliance that this decision established. And Justice Barrett's opinion basically said, well, the basic case says the burden's on the defendant, case closed. And, uh, the, you know, Justice Gors Gorsuch had a separate opinion where he said, well, I'm not sure that this really makes sense if you think about the way civil litigation generally works. And 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 we can sort of read basic more narrowly, but, but it was kind of just... For, that was enough for Justice Barrett uh, and the rest of the justice and the majority that sort of this is what Basic said and that there had been no uh, no one had asked uh, the, the court to overrule Basic, which I thought was interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think maybe maybe what we can see from Justice Barrett, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously speculation and maybe it, it could it could to some degree depend on being her first term, but uh, perhaps a, a little bit of a reluctance to disturb precedent. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Joe, why not, if you wanna jump in with Justice Barrett, also I asked for questions and now I'm getting them. So I think I might just try to throw some of these out to you all if you wanna try to answer them as we're going along, if it was your topic. And so Joe, the, 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 I'm gonna give you like two things at once, whatever you wanna say in Justice Barrett. And then the question I have on the shadow docket is, do you think that allowing the Supreme Court to make decisions without specific limitations on the types of decisions that can be made is a slippery so slope for the judiciary to be making their own policy. So anyway, tough assignment, two different things okay. at once. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to hit, 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 hit him quickly. I mean, I agree with Henry's assessment of Justice Barrett. I mean, I think this is kind of an over, uh, probably a dramatic oversimplification, but in terms of when I look at the six conservatives on the court, I, I generally think of the chief and Kavanaugh as being um, more willing sometimes to, to, you know, adopt narrow results, to stick with precedent that they may even disagree with. Um, whereas the other conservatives, uh, I, my sense is tend to be, well, well we're going to go with what we think the right answer is here. Um, and which camp Justice Barrett, I think it's too early to say which camp Justice Barrett could end up in, but it's possible there are indications, as Henry said, that she may end up more in the Chief Kavanaugh camp of kind of being more willing in some cases to adopt narrow results and uh, and uh, to kind of adhere to precedent, even if she may, may think as a matter of first principles that it wasn't correct. Um, so I'm not sure I quite understand the question. I mean, the, the um, you know, the court definitely has jurisdiction over all of these emergency orders. There's something called the All Writs Act that gives courts, all federal courts, jurisdiction to kind of in aid of their jurisdiction. So if a party can come to the Supreme Court and say, um, you know, my case is going to be moot or I'm not going to really be able to get meaningful relief uh, down the road unless you step in now, then the court clearly has jurisdiction to address that. I think that uh, a point that's maybe adjacent to what the questioner is asking is kind of what the standard should be. Um, the court has historically said there has to be kind of a clear and indisputable right to relief um, in addition to the other kind of traditional stay factors. And it's not clear in a lot of these cases that they're really adhering to that anymore. They often don't cite it. And it, it does seem that, um, you know, as Henry said, they seem to be making even making new law in some of these shadow docket orders, and, uh, particularly in religious liberty cases. Um, and it's hard to say that, you know, someone had a clear and indisputable right to relief if the opinion giving them relief actually makes a new rule of law. Okay, thanks so much, Joe. And so, Sarah, I'm going to give you the same thing. I have a question on what you asked and whatever you want to say in Justice Barrett. The question, uh, I said what you asked, what you discussed. Uh, the question simply is, uh, how, how do you think Justice 
Thomas uh, will utilize or has utilized this new procedure at oral argument to ask questions of the parties. Um, so anyway, and, 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 and whatever you think about Justice Barrett. Yeah, so I'll take the Justice Thomas question first. Um, because of the seriatim questioning, I, he would just ask questions. The chief would say, I'm done with my questions, Justice Thomas. And then Justice Thomas would ask questions and then he would pass the baton to the next justice. Um, so the question is, does he want to get involved in the scrum questioning? Uh, maybe not, he historically hasn't done that, but will he then use the sort of opportunity for the questions at the end to ask questions without having to participate in what I, a format I, I, I think he traditionally hasn't particularly liked. So we'll see, it'll be a fun thing to watch for the uh, October sitting in particular. And then just three kind of quick things on Justice Barrett that I think show her impact above and beyond the cases that we've discussed and the shadow docket, shadow docket votes. Uh, one is just grants. I mean, I don't think we would be seeing an abortion case or a, a, a Second Amendment case on the court's docket if she wasn't there. There may well have been four votes to grant, but I don't think those cases would get granted if the conservatives didn't think that there was five for a majority. And I'm not sure that that would have been the case in either case until Justice Barrett joined the court, or at least it gives people who might be anxious about those grants a little more comfort. So question mark, like, I, I do think she made a difference there. Second, um, oral argument questions. She's terrific. And she always went last because she was the most junior in the Siriano questioning. And I think she was incredibly effective in reading how the argument was going. And so I don't think our, most oral arguments do not matter to the outcome. I think that's true. But I also think the oral arguments can matter quite a bit to the way that the justices dispose of the case. And I think she shaped the outcomes in a bunch of cases by focusing on either practical problems with each side's argument or sort of angles that hadn't gotten enough coverage despite eight other justices having at it for, <laughs> for you know, 30 minutes up until then. And then third is just the behind the scenes influence point that I think Joe is pointing to, which is, I think she sort of straddles both camps. It's, I think it's too soon to tell exactly sort of where she's gonna fall on the spectrum, but I do think she kind of falls both one foot in the sort of chief camp and another foot in the, camp that is sort of the Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch camp, and being able to navigate both of those camps is a way to be very influential as a justice. So I think she'll be able to do that effectively. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I would just add, not that I'm a panelist, but as far as Justice Thomas, uh, you know, all these are available online and it, it is really interesting if you go and you, and you listen to the oral arguments from the last term. Uh, he was always up second and, and had a fair amount of questions in the ones I listened to. Uh, we're going to turn to the um, uh, high interest cases. Uh, the first case we're going to start with is uh, Henry's going to talk about. It's uh, Carson v. Macon. I hope I said the name right. And uh, it involves religious liberty. And I'll let Henry describe it more. Sure. So, so this is this is a, a, another uh the latest in a series of cases the court has 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 taken in recent years to decide uh, the the standards applicable to free exercise challenges when you have funding programs that discriminate to some degree against religious people and organizations and uh, there there uh, the, there's a 2017 decision in in a case called Trinity Lutheran where where the court held that that a, a, pro, a Missouri funding program that excluded churches from uh, obtaining funding to resurface uh, playgrounds. It was a church that, that, ran, that ran a school, uh, I believe. And that, that a, a, a program that excluded churches entirely uh, violated the free exercise clause because it discriminated on the basis of religious status as opposed to simply restricting how somebody may might use the funds, which uh, the, the court believe followed from, from an older case called Locke versus Davey that was decided in 2004 that the court read to establish this kind of distinction. There was a follow-up case a couple terms ago in a case called Espinoza, um, in which, which involved a, uh, a funding program that uh, basically a voucher type program that excluded religious schools. And uh, it, the, the court uh, said that that, that sort of exclusion too, by excluding religious, I believe it was excluded organizations owned or controlled by religious organizations, schools that were owned or controlled by religious organizations, said that, yep, that's status-based 
uh, discrimination as well, and that's 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 not okay. Um, it also, though, I, I think it's fair to say, sort of, uh, you know, distance itself further from this earlier decision, Locke versus Davy, and distinguish it uh, on other grounds apart from from this distinction as well. There's been a great debate uh, among among some of the justices, at least, whether this distinction between religious status and religious use really makes any sense at all. And with with some justices sort of taking the view, well, well, how is it? You know, just how is it any different to say you're excluding a church versus excluding uh, an organization that does religious things? Doesn't that really amount to just to much the same thing? And I think that sort of debate has is has come to a head in this in this Carson case uh, out of Maine, which involves a, a similar kind of 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 state funding program that uh, it's a it's a school tuition assistance program. Maine is a rural state; uh, it has public schools, but there are some parts of the state that uh, the public schools don't serve. And so, and so it has this funding program that in part substitutes for the, uh, these, uh, what public schools otherwise would be doing. And it, and it allows, uh, it allows schools to contract with the state to provide a public education. And it also allows, uh, sort of just private individuals to get tuition assistance from the state and to, uh, and to apply that at private schools. The, the program excludes religious schools as well. However, and and that's and seems pretty similar to you know just the way I've described it uh, as to the Espinoza case, but the, the 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 state was able to prevail below based on this sort of status use distinction. The state was able to convince the First Circuit that actually what what the the state program really attaches significance not to sort of the religious status of the school, but instead to the fact that it uh, that a school may be actually teaching uh, religious education. Uh, and which which uh, the state does not want to do, and so I think that this this this, this decision and and it sort of puts in stark relief this status versus use distinction, and uh, I suspect that the court may have taken this case to address whether whether that continues to be a valid distinction at all. The the main argument of the challengers is not that uh, the 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 program. Uh, discriminates on the basis of religious status, but rather that the distinction between status and use, which many have traced again to this old case called Locke versus Davey should be abolished and that case should be overruled, which is interesting that that, that is their frontline argument. There certainly may be arguments in the case and they make those as well, that, that it amounts to discrimination on the basis of religious status. Uh, my own sort of conjecture, um, reading the tea leaves, so to speak, is that uh, I think that it's it, it it may this may be a case in which the court basically um, says actually uh, the the decision below sort of has realized the fears of those who doubted the validity and stability of the status versus use distinction and so we're going to say that no 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 that that kind of thing uh, isn't uh, isn't valid although um, you know I'm mindful of the fact that they, they they were they declined to do that in Espinoza and and some of the new justices. Who have joined the court since Espinoza have indeed taken sort of a, uh, a expert, including Justice Barrett, as we've just been discussing, have 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 been sort of reluctant to revisit precedent. So it's it's sort of unclear how that's going to going to play out. I think, but but I I, I I if I had to guess, I'd say that they're probably going to the majority of the court at least is probably going to overrule Locke versus Davey and, and sort of eliminate that distinction. And that's the way they'll they'll rule for the uh, against the state in that case. Okay, thank you, Henry. Uh, Joe, did you want to give us your thoughts about this case? Uh, just, uh, just I'll be quick. I mean, it, uh, the votes of the liberal justices are kind of interesting in these cases. Um, in Trinity Lutheran, which Henry talked about, Justices Kagan and Breyer actually joined with the more conservative justices to say that that uh, restriction on funding was unconstitutional. Then in Espinoza, though, they went back to the kind of the liberal side of the uh, of the divide, which tends to be more separationist in these cases. I suspect that that's where they'll be in this one too, but they're, those are interesting votes to watch. Thank you, Sarah. I just think given this subject matter, it's sort of interesting that it takes a trinity of cases to get to like one principle of non-discrimination against religion. And it also sort of exemplifies the court can be very incrementalist. Uh, it's, it's literally had to take three cases to get to, I think what the end result will be is like the concurrence in Trinity Lutheran. So stay tuned. Interesting. Okay, very interesting. Um, before we move to the next case, uh, I do. I still have. I have two questions in the 
ants in the in the box here that I'm going to try to get to at the end about things we discussed in the general topics. But if you have questions about that case, you know, feel free to to put them up and we'll try to get to them at some point. Uh, the case we just discussed. And now we're going to move on to uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Corlett. Um, so we're moving from religion to guns. And Joe is going to talk about this case. Yeah, we're hit, hitting all the hot buttons today. And then I think Sarah's going to talk about abortion. Um, yeah, so this is the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. NYSERPA has an, kind of an unfortunate uh, acronym. Uh, it doesn't roll off the tongue exactly. Uh, but uh, it's, folks on this call probably know, you know, that, that the Supreme Court held in D.C. versus Heller that the Second Amendment um, includes an individual right to bear arms. That was obviously a huge consequential decision. A couple of years later, in a case called McDonald, they held that the that that was incorporated as against the states. Um, and then since then, it's just been kind of kind of crickets. The court uh, took a big uh, sec a Second Amendment case out of uh, New York, also brought by the same party, NYSERPA, uh, that ended up mooting out when New York City uh, repealed the, the law that was being challenged there. Um, and there's been some frustration among some of the justices about the courts um, in action in, in this area. Uh, Justice Thomas in particular has written dissents from denial saying that the courts in action and, and refusal to take additional Second Amendment cases in, uh, in the face of what he saw was kind of uh, erroneously restrictive readings of the Second Amendment and the lower courts had turned the Second Amendment into kind of a second class or disfavored right. Um, and then some of the justices were quite uh, upset in their separate writings when the court dismissed the, the previous NYSERPA case uh, as moot because they really wanted to address the merits. Um, the law here is about uh, the right, you know, so the Second Amendment provides the right to to keep and bear arms. So this is about the right to bear arms, to carry uh, uh, weapons outside of the home. Um, and New York really restricts that quite significantly, more so than a lot of states. Um, you have to um, generally, uh, you have to go to a local official and show proper cause if you want to, unless you're in one of a kind of a certain defined job categories, like you drive a Brinks armored truck or something like that. Um, if you just want to carry a gun for self-defense outside of your home, you have to, to file an application and you have to kind of articulate a specific reason. And you can't just say self-defense. You have to kind of show why why you in particular have a, a need for a weapon that's different from the general population. Um, so the plaintiffs here challenge that uh, under the Second Amendment, and they say, look, the default should be that you have a right to carry outside of the home unless you fall into kind of a disfavored category. If you're a felon or maybe an, if you're going to a particularly sensitive location like an air, airport. Um, and they say that the Second Amendment doesn't permit the New York to kind of flip the burden and make the default that you can't unless you go to a local official uh, and get permission. Um, a couple that are interesting things. One of the interesting things I think about this case is the way that it's being argued by by both sides. Um, and I think this kind of shows the one that this is a, obviously a conservative textualist originalist court, and also shows the ongoing influence of of, of not only Justice Thomas but of, of of Justice Scalia is that both sides really make originalist arguments. There's a ton of history in the briefs on and the amicus briefs the party briefs on both sides they both argue that um you know the the the, the tradition and, and and laws going back to the colonial period and even earlier the state talks about laws during the middle ages um support their view of what the founders intended with respect to uh the right to to, to bear arms new york's position is that they don't dispute that the Second Amendment extends outside the home, but they say there's a long tradition, including at the time of the founding, of regulation of the ability to carry arms outside of the home, and that what New York is doing here is completely of a piece with what's been done historically. Um, the challengers uh, obviously disagree, and they also uh, make a move that, that I think we're seeing in a lot of cases of late, which is... Um, recounting the kind of unsavory history of the law that they're challenging. And they point out that when New York adopted this law um, in the early 20th century, one of the motivations was to keep uh, immigrants, uh, particularly Italian immigrants, from carrying weapons. That's similar to an argument that was made in the Espinoza case that Henry talked about uh, that traced the history of Montana's restriction there to kind of anti-Catholic animus in the 19th century. Um, 
So uh, one last point I'll make again is that, it, that the focus on originalism is shown most patently by the fact that uh, Judge Ludig, former Fourth Circuit Judge Ludig, wrote, uh, filed a brief on the side of New York making originalist and historical arguments. And that just shows how kind of deeply into the court's methodology that, that, uh, that, that principle of originalism has, has migrated. Um, okay, uh, we got about 10 minutes left. So Henry, Sarah, if you can maybe be quick on this, because I want to give Sarah time on the on the Dobbs case. Um, uh, whoever, Henry, why don't you go first? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, I, I think that the, in light of New York's concession that, that you know, the Second Amendment does, ex- right, does quote, the quote, right, does extend outside the home. It just raises an interesting question. I hope the court clarifies that if you agree with that, what that means in terms of how you figure out whether uh, a law actually violates that right, because there's been a lot of confusion in the lower courts about how one actually figures out, um, you know, whether a law that burdens uh, the the right to possess a gun to some degree is actually unconstitutional. We have a sort of reticulated frameworks, very reticulated frameworks for how that kind of inquiry is supposed to go that the Supreme Court has established in other contexts. We kind of don't for the Second Amendment. I certainly I hope and, and probably expect the court to, to, to take that on to some degree in this case, which I think would be a welcome development. Okay, uh, Sarah, um, maybe if you wanna talk uh, about the, the New York uh, guns case, and then it, you feel free to move right into your uh, abortion case. Sounds great. So on Second Amendment, just one quick point, which is I couldn't agree more with Joe. I think it, the case really exemplifies the whole we're all originalists now trend. Um, I look forward to placing over and under bets on how many times the statute of Northampton will be mentioned in different opinions. And I actually think it's a kind of case that moves a ball and people debating what does it actually mean to be an originalist and like, how are you supposed to do that? So I, I think it's cool methodologically. So also you may have noticed there's an abortion case on the calendar this term. Um, It's called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. The question presented is whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. So to talk about an abortion case, I actually think the most interesting thing is not sort of describing like the different arguments, like what is abortion, like is it good or bad, that sort of stuff. Uh, You can do that at home. I'm sure everyone has opinions on this. I actually think the interesting thing in thinking about how the Supreme Court is gonna look at it are sort of three questions. One, why did the court grant this case? Two, what are the party's strategies? How are they thinking about the case strategically? And three, what is my guess about what the court's gonna do? Uh, With full disclosure, don't hold me to it. It's anyone's guess. But let me just sort of start with why was this granted? Um, An interesting feature of this case is that the petition was up for consideration first in late September, 2020. There were 20 plus relists and the court ended up granting it in May, 2021, near the end of the term and limited it just to the question that I recited about viability, not about third party standing or other stuff that was in the case. Um, and why grant it? There wasn't a traditional circuit split. It was coming on the heels of June Medical. The court does not seem to like abortion cases. They try, Usually they try to space them out a little more. My feeling is not just a Justice Barry getting added to the case, but a feeling after June Medical perhaps that it was already evident from the lower court decisions that June Medical, especially because of the divided opinion in that case in which Justice Breyer went before justices and the chief sort of peeled off. Um, that opinion, just to put simply, creates sort of some uncertainty about what the undue burden standard is for evaluating whether restrictions on abortion are constitutional under the court's current jurisprudence. Uh, and the court might've just thought they wanna clean it up. They're gonna get cases on this forever and uh, they just wanna bite the bullet. That's my best guess. So moving to the strategy, what are the parties doing here? Uh, super interesting strategic case. The advocates on both sides are superb. Uh, for Mississippi, it's Scott Stewart, their new solicitor general, really experienced advocate. And for the um, respondent abortion clinics, Jeff Fisher is leading the briefing. He is a regular before the court, has done a lot of these cases, a lot of criminal cases, super, super experienced. So the briefing on both sides is superb. And it's people who are very shrewd, I think, tactically. Mississippi is taking the swing for the fences approach. They are saying, like, we're going to level with you, court. Uh, Roe versus Wade and Casey are just wrong. Uh, there is no way around sort of dealing with that. If you could sort of dance around what is a viability standard, what does it mean to have a burden based on viability or not? But let's be honest, Mississippi is saying, uh, this is the case to just figure out what do you want to do with your abortion jurisprudence. And so they're very candid with that. Um, and I think that is a 
the strategy is they think that they have, I, I would guess, think that they have three or four justices likely to agree with that sort of maximalist approach and that they can push the other conservative justices at least to a better outcome by not sort of compromising against themselves from the start. The respondents are, I think, playing for the court's stare decisis stands because they are they sort of have a two-pronged approach. One is they're saying on substance, Roe and Casey are super precedents. The courts repeatedly affirmed them six weeks from Sunday in lots and lots of cases. There's no good alternative to the viability test and the court shouldn't sort of diverge from it. And basically it's sort of like you could just draw a picture of a cheerleader like holding up the sign, stare decisis. They don't even want to engage uh, with is this the best way to draw the lines or not? They're just saying the court's done this forever. You like to follow your own precedents. Don't depart from it here or the court's legitimacy will really be hurt. And then procedurally, they're saying you really shouldn't do it here because Mississippi, they say at the petition stage, really made it sound like this case was about the viability standard and kind of cleaning up the court's abortion jurisprudence as opposed to just taking on Roe and Casey itself. Um, so strategically, I think both of these briefs are saying starting off with sort of pretty stark opening positions. And I think both of them are really, what they're playing for is not necessarily the positions in their brief, but a compromise position under which they can win. Because, and this brings me to my best guess about what the court will do. Um, the best guess I have is that it'll be something like Casey itself, which is the court is probably not gonna give either side exactly what it wants. It will probably go somewhere in the middle. If I had to guess, um, I think that they will find some way to try to uphold Mississippi's restrictions, but maybe in a very narrow way could involve a remand. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Henry, you want to give us your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, that, 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 that all sounds right to me. I, I think it is an interesting strategy as an advocate that I, I wonder, I wonder what, what in particular Mississippi thinks that the court is likely to do. I mean, my, you know, if you think that the court is going to rule narrowly, you know, it's interesting that you spend most of your brief talking about how Roe should be overruled rather than sort of get, giving the court the best, the best path to do that. So it's just an interesting approach. And, and I'm quite frankly, not sure which one is, 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 is correct. I can see arguments on both sides. Okay. Joe. Yeah, kind of keeping with the tactical theme that Sarah opened with and Henry uh, went to, um, I thought that, that that tracing the Mississippi argument in the court was interesting, because if you look back at their petition, it was really the kind of narrow argument, you should kind of clarify the law. And there was just a footnote on Roe and Casey basically saying, we're not asking you to overrule them, but you know, if you, if, if you feel like it, you should. Um, but then by the time you get to the merits brief, there's a whole section saying overrule Roe and Casey. And and I'll just point out that, you know, Justice Ginsburg is on the court when they file that petition. It's held over multiple times when they file their merits brief. They've got Justice Barrett. So it's, it's possible, at least, that their thinking about the strategy was affected by the changed composition of the court. Yeah. Um, OK, we have like about two minutes left. I didn't time this exactly right, but that's good. It, it's been very interesting. Um, I there's a bunch. Of, there's a, I asked for questions now. I have more than we're going to be able to answer, but I'll just go back to one that uh, someone would like to know a little bit more about the court's authority uh, to eliminate or limit the use of national inject, uh, injunctions and what would be the motivating or inhibiting factors that would likely influence the court in ruling on that. Do any of you want to jump in and take that? I guess maybe that's in Joe's shadow docket or is that? Yeah, I don't know. The court, I mean, yeah, the court could do something. Congress could also do something. And their one proposal, for instance, is to say that all cases seeking a national injunction should go to the, the DC district court. And then with a direct review in the Supreme Court, you know, as, as an effort to kind of rationalize the, the practice, because the practice right now is plaintiffs kind of do some judge shopping, right? They, they, they file these cases in a place where they think they'll get uh, the relief that they want based on who's likely to be assigned it. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to give each of you, we only got a minute, but if anybody wants to chime in on any other cases that we should be looking for in the in the upcoming term that we haven't mentioned that they think are really interesting. I'll just jump yeah. in quickly. The one case that pretty much everyone who follows the Supreme Court tends to ask about or talk about is not even a granted case. It's the Harvard case challenging Harvard's affirmative action policies. Um, the court called for the views of the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General has not yet said what what the office thinks, although I think it is safe to say that they probably will not follow the Trump administration position, which was that Harvard's affirmative action practices were unconstitutional. Um, but we will see what happens on that front next. Um, 
I think the betting would be it's a likely grant, but the court perhaps did not want to grant it having guns, abortion, <laughs> and race all at the start of the term. Yeah. Uh, we're at one o'clock, but Henry, Joe, anything you want to maybe just say quickly about any other cases you're watching? Uh, keep an eye on the, the uh, Boston Marathon bombing case is in the court, the Zarnarev case, and that's about, it doesn't present uh, questions about guilt or innocence, it's about the sentencing and about also whether uh, the jurors were uh, properly questioned during voir dire about their exposure to media about the case. You know, obviously that was a big deal in Boston uh, in particular, um, and um, the, the, the First Circuit found that the district court uh, erroneously limited the ability of defense counsel to question potential jurors uh, about their exposure to, to media and public discussion of the of the case. So that's the, one of the core issues there. Good. Uh, Henry, anything? Yeah, the one case I'll mention, uh, and this, this is probably a little uh, in, in the weeds for, for some folks, but it could be doctrinally significant is the city of Austin case, which involves uh, the subject matter is not that perhaps not that scintillating. It involves a, a First Amendment challenge to the city of Austin's uh, on-premises, off-premises sign regulation. Um, I think doctrinally, though, the, the distinction could, the decision could be significant because it, it implicates pretty significant questions under the First Amendment about when you have a content-based regulation that would trigger strict scrutiny. And the Fifth Circuit basically said, like, well, if it involves words and the regulators got to read it, strict scrutiny. Um, and, you know, this is a, this off, on it. Well, I, I wrote an amicus brief in this case, full disclosure, like saying that I thought the Fifth Circuit got it wrong. But uh, you know, if the Fifth Circuit is correct, then I think it has quite significant implications for, re for regulation, a lot of which proceeds through reading stuff. So. Well, I want to thank each of you. It's been really been interesting to hear your insights. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there for listening. I apologize. I didn't get every question answered, but I'm glad that so many of you are interested. And uh, hopefully we can have, you know, uh, all or some of you back next year, unless one of you is the U.S. Solicitor General next year. And uh, <laughs> and uh, anyhow, I really, really thank you. It's great for our members. Uh, and I hope all of you out there uh, have enjoyed it. And uh, Pat. Our president, uh, Pat Kilbane, he's not going to get back on. He wanted me to close. So, um, you know, be on the lookout for our next meeting. Thank you.